Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from the Frontier. I hope the week's gone well. We've had a very wet, we've had a deluge here in Nairobi, and according to social media, it seems to be playing out in many other countries uh, in the region as well. But, uh, it's been quite uh, extraordinary, storm drunk and all of that. Macro thoughts go back to Stanley Druckenmiller. As a macro investor, my job for 30 years was to anticipate changes in the economic trends that were not expected by others and therefore not yet reflected in securities prices. Here is a chart of the S&P over the past 50 years, color-coded by percentage of previous record on a log scale, the position. Home thoughts, I like this tweet from Barack Obama, have fun out there among the stars, uh, referencing Stephen Hawking. That took me to Point Omega and Don DeLillo. We're the last billionth of a second in the evolution of matter. New Scientist has an interesting article why the Big Bang was not the beginning. Although everyone has heard of the Big Bang, no one can say confidently what it was like. After all, recounting the beginning of time is about finding not just the right words, but the right physics. And ever since the Big Bang entered the popular lexicon, that physics has been murky. Um, though often misattributed to the US astronomer Edwin Hubble, the basic, of the, the basic idea of the Big Bang dates back to the Belgian priest and astronomer, Georges Lemaitre, who observed in the late 1920s that the universe is expanding. Extrapolating backwards, Lemaitre imagined a primeval atom that ballooned into everything we see today. I like this photograph by Beyond Travel, quoting Rabindranath Tagore. Clouds come floating into my life, no longer to carry rain or usher storm, but to add colour to my sunset sky. You either get the point of Africa or you don't. What draws me back year after year is that it's like seeing the world with the lid off, A.A. A. Gill. And finally, I envy the guys with a clear view of the fresh snowfall on Mount Kenya today and cuss the guy who put this billboard on my line of sight. Good morning from Mayor of Kevin Wender. Political reflections, the statement said the use of Novi Chok constitutes the first offensive use of a nerve agent in Europe since the Second World War. That was quite a forthright statement that the Europeans with the British put out. Um, I could resist this photograph from Phil Noble. The Russian ambassador's residence in London couldn't look more ominous if it tried. According to Kosachov uh, via IFX and Lee Sachs, the West is preparing public opinion for, po for possible use of military force in the wake of the Skripal case. Um, I still think, you know, the facts, and this is the whole non-linearity of, of, of these issues, is that it's very difficult to pin things on any one individual. And so far, I think that case has not been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Gary Kasparov, who tends to sit in opposition to Vladimir Putin, has written an interesting piece, The Truth About Putin. The domain name Putin 2018 RU was registered in 2010 during the Obama administration's infamous reset with Russia and its dreams of Dmitry Medvedev liberalization. Putin 2024 RU, Putin 2030 RU, and Putin 36 RU have also been locked up, in case you were wondering. 
This is not to say that a dictator or his policies cannot have popular support. The problem is defining what support means after 18 years of a personality cult and 24-7 propaganda that portray, portrays Putin as a demigod protecting Russia from deadly enemies without and within. A year of fake news trolling and half-baked social media memes in half of America and its vaunted media running in circles in 2016. Imagine what it does to a population when that's all there is every hour, every day for nearly two decades. Last week's attempted assassination with a nerve agent of a former Russian spy in England reminds us that Putin is willing to poison bodies in the free world, not only minds. Why would he do this? Why would he call attention to his murderous ways now? Well, I'll turn that around and ask instead, why wouldn't he? Dictators don't ask why, they ask why not. Putin killed the FSB whistleblower Alexander Litivenko with a radioactive isotope in the centre of London in 2006. What price did he pay? Three British Prime Ministers collaborated in hushing up the investigation in order not to offend Putin and shut down the countless billions of Russian cash that has flooded Britain in the last decades. After 18 years in power, Putin believes he could buy or bully his way out of anything. Will anyone prove him wrong? That's Gary Kasparov. 5th of December 2016, I wrote a piece we have a deviate Tomahawk and essentially was saying that he had interfered with the US election. Um, Washington Post, Ignatius, Putin's aggressive use of covert action to settle scores hit an international tripwire. Um, and it certainly seems to have done exactly that. October 2015, I wrote a piece, Putin is a geopolitical grandmaster, referencing the launching of his intervention in Syria. Today, H.R. McMaster proposes serious political and economic consequences for Russian aggression, including atrocities in Syria and the abhorrent nerve agent attack on Sergei Skirpal. Hours later, Trump decides to remove H.R. McMaster as his national security advisor. The diplomat asks, why is North Korea keeping silent on the Trump-Kim meeting? And one can only speculate on the reasons behind Pyongyang's silence. And certainly, it's been very visible, hasn't it? First of all, it's most likely that Kim Jong-un was caught off guard by Trump's impulsive decision to reportedly made on the spot when the South Korean delegation was in the White House briefing U.S. officials on their just-completed Pyongyang trip. Second, Kim's invitation to Trump was verbally relayed by South Korean officials who may not have conveyed Kim's message accurately or completely. Before the South Korean envoys traveled to Pyongyang, they were not even sure whether they would be able to meet Kim Jong-un. It turned out that Kim met with them on the day of their arrival, and much of the conversation between Kim and the South Korean delegation took place over a lavish dinner. TV footage shows alcohol was served and captured. Um, a high-spirited Kim with a broad smile waving goodbye to his guests at the end of the dinner. It is questionable whether everything he said during that dinner reflects his true thing. 12th of February, I was speaking about uh, Kim's uh, use of his sister, I called it a secret weapon, Kim uh, Yo Jong, and I was saying she bamboozled the South Korean President Moon River. I'm not so sure, I think that was a bit unfair. I think Moon River's playing a very clever hand as well. And the way he flatters Trump shows he's learned his work well. Um, I was then talking about soft power, water is fluid, soft and yielding, but water will wear away rock which is rigid and cannot yield. 
as a rule, whatever is fluid, soft and yielding will overcome whatever is rigid and hard. This is another paradox. What is soft is strong. September 2017, I wrote, a screaming comes across the sky. I was referencing a spate of uh, tests that Kim did around that period. I was talking about gravity's rainbow, which is about the design, production, and dispatch of V2 rockets by the German military. In particular, it features the quest undertaken by several characters to uncover the secret of a mysterious device named the Schwarzgerät, the black device, slated to be installed in a rocket with the serial number 000000 as the world watches Pyongyang. I cannot help but wonder if Kim Jong-un has read Pynchon, which speaks of a screaming coming across the sky. It is a curve each of them feels, it is the parabola. They must have guessed once or twice, guessed and refused to believe that everything always collectively had been moving toward that purified shape latent in the sky. A shape of no surprise, no second chance, no return. And then in November 2010, I'd written a piece about the Hermit Kingdom, saying far away, distant lands, lies the Hermit Kingdom. They've all had tiny little hands like the elves and the elves and the shoemaker. No Tillerson, no problem. South Korea's foreign minister, originally scheduled to meet Rex in Washington, will meet Iveco instead. So there's still some uncertainty around the situation and the silence from Pyongyang is truly remarkable. Saudi Arabia pledges to create a nuclear bomb if Iran does. 13th of November 2017, I said the paranoia of the palaces in Saudi Arabia is real and existential. Same article, how can I communicate with them while they prepare for the arrival of al Mahdi al Montazar? And then at uh, the same time, you know, that was the night before the long knives. And of course, who popped up in Saudi Arabia to coach the crown prince? It was Jared Kushner. But overall, I still think it's an unprecedented moment in the history of the kingdom and the most perilous moment for the House of Saud that I can recall. And I said then, taking on Iran looks like the straw that breaks the camel's back. One Saudi woman whom US officials say has not benefited from the prince's rise, his own mother. Fourteen current and former senior U.S. officials told NBC News that intelligence shows Prince Mohammed bin Salman, often referred to by his initials MBS, blocked his mother from seeing his father, King Salman, more than two years ago and has kept her away from him as the young prince rapidly amassed power. Prince Mohammed uh, has concocted various explanations of his mother's whereabouts over the years, such as that she's out of the country receiving medical treatment, so King Salman would not know his son had been behind her continued absence. Um, they said the king has told people around him that he misses her and apparently does not know her true location or status. Multiple US officials have told NBC News previously that their interactions with the king suggest he is not consistently lucid. Of course, the, the Crown Prince bought the Salvatore Mundi, which is a painting of Christ, a Salvatore Mundi, Latin for Saviour of the World, by the Italian artist Leonardo da Vinci. Rex Tillerson is seen in this photograph boarding his plane at the end of a five country swing through Africa that turned out to be his swan song, as US Secretary of State. Muller just stepped over Trump's red line and is connecting some dots. Last July, President Trump warned the special counsel, Robert Muller, that it would be a violation for him and his group of Justice Department investigators to examine the Trump's family, fan family finances. Muller apparently has decided to cross that line anyway, the report uh, on Thursday said that Muller's team had subpoenaed Trump's company. Trump organization. Muller's probe seems to be pursuing three primary questions. The first is whether Trump or his campaign worked with the Kremlin to tilt the 2016 election 
in Trump's favor. The second is whether Trump or his advisors obstructed justice to derail the federal investigation. The third involves the possibility of financial quid pro quo that Trump and his family members, especially his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, may have sought in exchange for public policy favors, like, for example, possibly lifting economic sanctions on Russia or shifting U.S. Ukraine policy. August 2017, I said any financial expert will tell you that President Trump's financial affairs are a smoking gun. Trudeau's foreign fumbles are haunting him at home after a debacle in New Delhi. International markets, SG's and Edwards, I believe Germany's gargantuan trade surplus will soon attract Trump's full attention. Have a look at this chart from Holger. Other countries with bigger surpluses as a percentage of GDP, like Switzerland, Holland, and Singapore. But these countries are small. Germany's surplus is now in dollar terms biggest in the world. Let's move on to the currency markets. Euro dollar 123.08 dollar index back above 90 at 90.07. Japanese yen, where's that? Let's take a look. 105.95. Uh, Swiss franc 0.9506. The pound 139.28. The Australian dollars uh, dropped at 8% yesterday, it's now at 0.7792. India rupee 64.845. South Korean won 1068.36. Brazilian real 328.55. Egyptian pound 17.6155. And the rand is at 1189.51. This is an Ichimoku chart from T commodity of the dollar index, which is about 90. I think one should be long for the stock at 88. Euro dollar, this is a three month chart, lost at 123.10. We've been working around these sorts of levels, even as high as 124, but the key level of resistance is at 125.60. Cryptocurrencies are getting destroyed in 2018. Only one of the 23 biggest cryptos is green on a year to date basis. This is from Charlie Bilello. Um, you know, I've been bearish about Bitcoin since the beginning of the year and advocating a small, longer ripple. Digital economy in the U.S. has been growing at triple the pace of U.S. GDP. Digital economy has grown at an average annual rate of 5.6% in the 11 years through 2016, compared with 1.5% in the economy as a whole, according to a report Thursday by the Commerce Department's Bureau of economic analysis. U.S. digital economy accounted for $1.2 trillion, or 6.5% of GDP in 2016. Commodity markets, crude oil lost, and I look, $61.17. Key level is $60. Make or break level for gold, this is from T Commodity, $1,317 uh, $1, an ounce. I prefer on balance to be short here. The diamond tycoon behind India's alleged $2 billion bank fraud. This is Nirav Modi. Take a look at him. Um, Nirav Modi's jewelry store on Madison Avenue in the fall of 2015 attracted a listers from actress Naomi Watts to Donald Trump Jr. Turkish lira hit fresh lows versus the euro as Erdogan rejects call to end Syria offensive. Whatever the European Parliament says goes in one ear and out to the other. The Ivory Coast is selling 1.7 billion euros of bonds on Thursday in the biggest issuance of debt in the common currency from an African government. 12-year notes and 30-year notes, um, largest amount of euro debt issued by an African sovereign since at least the start of this century. It's been Hallison days for sub-Saharan African sovereign issuers um, Ghana's upscaled to two and a half billion. South Africa's going to raise three. Kenya raised as well. And uh, there's plenty of liquidity still in that European market. I called it Hallison days for African issuers from the Latin Alcyone, daughter of Aeolius and wife of Sikhs, when her husband died in a shipwreck. Alcyone threw herself into the sea, whereupon the gods transformed them both into Hallison birds, kingfishers. When Alcyone made her nest on the beach, waves threatened to destroy it. 
Aeolius, who strained his wits and kept them calm during seven days in each year so she could lay her eggs. These became known as Hallison days, when storms do not occur. The day the term is used to denote a past period that has been remembered for being happy and all successful. According to Afrobarometers, 6 in 10 Tanzania and 62% say the country is headed in the right direction, a turnaround from just 25% in 2014. There's been some negotiations in the DR Congo uh, between the government uh, and uh, the miners. They only wanted to look after their own interests and not also the interests of the Congolese people. The new mining code strips away a stability clause protecting existing investments from changes in the fiscal and customs regime for 10 years, opens the door for cobalt royalties to increase fivefold, and introduces a 50% windfall profits tax. Apparently, a breakthrough appeared to come after Kabwalulu, the mines minister, promised the miners that their concerns would be addressed on a case by case basis in the regulations to be hammered out after the code was signed, according to Kikaya. Kabila then exits the room, leaving his advisors and the executives to figure out how to break the news. We expect to remain dollarized for some time, that's Zimbabwe's Reserve Bank Governor speaking at the conference. My nephew has a new classmate from Zimbabwe, and upon discovering that Zimbabwe is in Africa, these kids are six, the first thing everyone asked him is if he'd been to Wakanda. Um, his reply, no, there are force fields around it, I thought it was brilliant. I say it was a coup d'etat. Some people have refused to call it a coup d'etat, says as Mugabe in an interview with foreign media. Um, we must undo this disgrace which we have imposed on ourselves. We don't deserve it. Zimbabwe doesn't deserve it. In this short video, you can see Mugabe being introduced to journalists at his mansion yesterday. Zimbabwe is also making consultations about rejoining the Commonwealth, as Foreign Minister has said. South African oil shares down 2.19% so far this year. Dollar versus Rand, a last trading 11.89. I think you buy it at 12, looking for a rally down to 11. The Nigerian oil shares up 10.31% this year. The Ghana Stock Exchange Composite Index is up 25.32% this year. According to the Business Daily, and I've read this audit, audit reveals troubled retailer Nakamat suffered an 18 billion trillion fraud. Um, uh, I've spoken about this at length, and this is a question of finance in the last rights now, I'm afraid. Nielsen has tipped Kenyan retailers to go online, where about one out of every four consumers browse for products and services. The opportunity for growth is inspired by the on-the-go lifestyle, Kenyans, which creates the need for speed, whether it is the consumption experience, ready-to-consume, shopper experience, proximity and efficiency, and engagement experience driven by a two-way interaction and easy-to-use apps. By keeping an eye on the future, retailers will find pockets of growth and truly leverage Kenyans' growing demand for greater ease, utility and suitability to meet consumers' shifting needs and fluctuating confidence levels. The retail space has thrived through traditional dukas and tabletops and modern store supermarkets, with the sector experiencing a double-digit growth every year, the survey said. It notes that modern trade stores grew by 36 stores in the last quarter of 2017 to 660 uh, in the period as the number of traditional stores and specialist outlets increased. It's 22nd of Jan this year, I wrote a piece and in it I was talking about e-commerce and home-based deliveries having changed the world from London to China. And I said, given the ubiquity of the smartphone here in Kenya, I'm certain the same disruption is headed our way and that a lot of commercial real estate will be legacy assets. The millennials with their avocado eating and cryptocurrency trading ways are just as likely to be African as they are European or American. Swedish firm is to drop its cash printing suite. This was entirely vexatious in my view. 
The battle for Kenya's multi-billion trillion currency printing tender has taken a new turn after Swedish firm Crane AB, success, which successfully appealed the award of the tender to rival De La Rue before the review board applied for leave to withdraw from the court case. Crane AB, which moved to court seeking to be awarded the 10 billion shilling a year currency printing tender on the ground that it was the lowest bidder, wants to be allowed to withdraw without offering an explanation. Of course, that does not account for De La Rue's investment, the fact that printing currency for 30 countries out of Nairobi. When you look at that impact of that, uh, of that deal, it far dwarfs whatever might have been the differential here. So, good news for De La Rue. Nairobi all shares up 6.82% year-to-date. Barclays up 24.479% uh, year-to-date, excluding any dividends. Kengen crossed 9, that's up 5.26% year-to-date. NSC 20 is up 1.49% year-to-date. My piece over the weekend was the rapprochement, um, and do have a read. And as you can see from this statistic, if you look at Kenya Inc.'s history of the last 25 years, has been the politics that has weighed on our economy, as you can see. So that's why it's a bonus sign. Once again, thank you for stopping by. Wishing you a tremendous weekend.